Hello, I'm Justin Cadenoso, a correspondent for the environmental news organization Manga Bay and a professor of journalism at Wake Forest University. We are here to speak with three leading experts about the broad impacts of artisanal and small scale gold mining on the Amazon rainforest. The timing of this panel is deliberate. Current research tells us the Amazon is suffering gravely from the increasing deforestation that's going on there. As it loses trees and biodiversity, the Amazon's capacity to continue to slow the rate of global warming during this climate crisis is being diminished. In working to help save the world's largest tropical forest, it is vital to understand and address the issues connected to so much small-scale gold mining that's going on now. Our panelists are among the most knowledgeable experts on these issues playing out now in Peru and Brazil. Through the application of their own research, they seek to develop and encourage transformative solutions to this growing environmental and social justice emergency. Let me introduce them. Miles Silman is a conservation biologist at Wake Forest University with more than 30 years of ecosystem research in the Andes and the Amazon. He is a founder of the Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation, or CINCIA. CINCIA is a pioneering research center in the Peruvian Amazon dedicated to understanding and reducing the environmental and societal damage from artisanal and small-scale gold mining. Luis Fernandez is the executive director of CINCIA and a research associate professor at Wake Forest University's Department of Biology. He's a global expert on the environmental and human hazards associated with using mercury in gold mining and has studied tropical forests for over 25 years. Deborah Goldenberg is a conservation specialist with World Wildlife Fund Brazil. She has worked in the Brazilian Amazon for 15 years and studies the commercial and logistical elements that enable more and more gold mining across South America. We will start our questions with Miles Silman. Miles, tell us first about Madre de Dios, this, this department in Southern Peru and why this area is so important environmentally to Amazonia and globally as it relates to climate change and climate change mitigation. Yeah, thanks, Justin. When we think about the Amazon, one of the things we have to think about is just how big it is. So it's vast. It would swallow Europe and it has many, many different parts. When we think about the entire border of the Amazon, we don't often think about it running up to the very top of the Andes. And when we look at that entire area, it has about maybe 20% of all the species on the planet living within those borders. Well, Mater de Dios is interesting because it's situated right up against the base of the Andes. And we talk about it as being a single department in Peru, but it's about twice the size of Costa Rica. It has as many bird species in it as all of Central America. So it's a, it's a really high biodiversity place. And if you take the surrounding areas going up to the top of the Andes, uh, it has the world's highest concentration of biodiversity. Miles, you've described the biodiversity there, but there's a lot more in those jungles and those rainforests that, than just uh, tree species and animals and birds. Tell us about them. Yeah, the other interesting thing about Madre de Dios is it's kind of the forgotten quarter of the Amazon. So it now is where many of the places in Brazil were 20, 25 years ago. And what that's led to are still vast expanses of forest, large protected areas. And it's the home of people still living in isolation. So large uh, numbers of indigenous peoples and people who have been keeping themselves in isolation since the rubber boom. So we have climate change that's affecting these ecosystems and affecting the people that live there. We also have this mining activity, which has dramatically increased in the region over the last 10 years. Miles, what are some of the factors that are driving uh, this artisanal gold mining in this area? And what's happening as a result? Yeah, so I think you know the, the fundamental driver is that there's a lot of gold in the sediments and it's not that hard to get. And so as the price of gold uh, picked up, there have been mining there uh, for hundreds, probably thousands of years. Uh, as, the, as the price of gold started to increase, particularly after 2000, the amount of mining increased. And then a couple of things happened. One is that this apartment was connected by road to the next largest city in Cusco, but it was a trip. Uh, the road was so bad, it could take weeks to get down there, even though it's only about 500 kilometers. And so the road was being improved. The road ended up being paved in the mid 2000s. And uh, that allowed a lot more people uh, and goods that you need for mining to flow into the area. Uh, 
Then as the, uh, so you started to get the economies of scale and uh, the mining centers uh, separated out from just a few large areas into smaller areas because people could get the goods that they needed in order to, in order to mine. So when they go in there to mine, what's the process like? I mean, they're taking down a lot of trees. They're, they're, they're having a fairly uh, significant impact on the landscape. Yeah, the impact on the landscape is tremendous. So uh, the process of, it, of the mining is uh, you go into an area, you cut down all the trees, and then you uh, e- you move the soil. And you either do that using heavy machinery, so excavators, uh, those kinds of things, or you use water cannons. So you liquefy the soil and you put it through a sluice, and then you wash out everything that's good in that soil and get the sediments uh, out and then mix that with mercury to get the gold. It, it seems like a fairly obvious question, Miles, but what happens to the biodiversity that you spoke of as this uh, deforestation to allow mining escalates? Yeah, there's two levels to the biodiversity. So the first part is, you know, it's kind of obvious in that locality, the biodiversity is 100% gone, say maybe a few things that can live in the soil and then stuff that recolonizes uh, very slowly after the mining's gone. But it's something else you need to think about is the larger amount of, of biodiversity. So what happens in the landscape? And if that mining is small, uh, it can recover. It becomes a small part of the landscape. Um, there are ways you can mitigate it. But when it starts to become large expanses, uh, you have the degradation of the area itself, but then degradation that moves into the adjacent forests. And then you start to cut off the flows of animals and plants that create a forest. Is gold mining um, a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, it's a it's a really large uh, greenhouse gas emission. When you look at the extent of gold mining, it's still increasing, right? Gold prices are still high and it's spreading in every country, not only in, in Latin America and the Amazon, but in all the tropical countries of the world. When you think about it though, even you, we always tend to think about carbon as being in the trees and the greenhouse gas as being in the trees above the soil. But when you look at those areas, you go down and look at the earth that's been turned through, put through a sluice, liquefied, all the good stuff washed out of it. You're left with basically sand afterwards. Well, there was as much carbon in the first meter of that soil as there was in the forest above it. And then when you get to the next meter, two meters, three meters, four meters down, there was another forest's worth of carbon in there. And what's really bad about it is that once you get below a meter, that that carbon in the soil is thousands to tens of thousands of years old, it looks like. Uh, And so what you're doing is liberating carbon back up into the atmosphere that was in a long-term pool. It's not quite like burning coal, but it's getting close, at least on human timescales. And and all this for extracting these flecks of gold that are are mixed in with all this alluvial soil and and, and pulling it out. Miles, you're a conservation ecologist and and you've been studying this area for a long time. You've, You've witnessed a lot of this damage you've just described. What are your biggest concerns about this accelerating pace of mining in Madre de Dios? Yeah, so natural resource extraction is is a bargain that we make where we, as a society, say we're going to destroy some of the environment because it gives us enough return where we think it's worth it. And uh, one of the things I worry about is that it's it's like a wildfire. It's spreading. It's spreading largely without regulation. And what we try and do is when we make that bargain for natural resource extraction is that we try and mitigate it to the extent where we leave something for future generations to do something else on the land. And that's what's not happening in Madre de Dios. A lot of the research that's happening at Cincia uh, shows that if you do things like bank topsoil and other kinds of forms of mitigation, that you're going to destroy biodiversity, uh, but that the forest can come back in a use in a usable way, or the land can be used for something different in the future, uh, with with just small precautions. And that's not happening now. And I just uh, I worry about the the societal bargain that's being made and what's going to happen in the future. Miles, thank you. I, w- I want to move to Luis now. Um, Luis, you have also spent a number of years in this part of the world. You've witnessed the same devastation that Miles has. Your expertise is in in mercury. So how important, how critical is mercury in the process of this small-scale gold mining? And how can you help us understand the impact? Um, Mercury is a substance that's been used since before Roman times to mine gold. So this is not something that's specific to the Amazon or or to Peru, uh, but is really like one of the first technologies that was used at scale to be able to mine. 
Um, and uh, the advantages are of using mercury is that it's very easy to use. Essentially, uh, you're mixing sand that contains um, some flecks of gold, and, and, it, and it doesn't have to be a lot of gold. We're talking about um, a gram of gold per 20 tons of sand. And, and mercury is uh, useful enough to be able to capture those tiny flecks uh, through a really simple process. It could be as simple as just getting a 55 gallon drum, filling, filling it halfway with sand, add some water, and add maybe just a, a handful uh, or a capful of mercury uh, in there. And then you basically just mix it up. And, and what that does, it, it allows people with uh, virtually no training uh, to be able to uh, capture enough gold that represents maybe a month's worth of salary in, in an eight hour shift. Um, and, and that's really transformative for, uh, for some people. It can be transformative for the miners because it represents economic opportunity, but it comes at a very high environmental and public health costs. Because the downside is that although it's magic for the mining process, it's, it's poison for life, really. It's one of the top three most uh, dangerous heavy metals. Um, and it is something that persists for centuries uh, or thousands of years because it's an element. It doesn't break down. It stays in the environment. Uh, and it's something that, uh, unfortunately, places like Madre de Dios and uh, more than 80 countries are having to deal with um, on a scale that we haven't seen before. I want you to try to explain that scale, because when you describe this, it sounds like there's only a little bit of mercury that's needed when actually there's cumulatively, there's a lot of mercury coming into Peru. How do you help us understand that? Sure. Well, I, I should say that um, artisanal scale gold mining, and, and I will qualify the term artisanal scale because um, we commonly use the word artisan uh, for coffee and bread and uh, things that are kind of positive. There's a nostalgic aspect to it. Uh, but in some cases, the old way of doing things are, are kind of some of the worst ways of doing things. And, and that's the, the term. So I will use small scale gold mining um, uh, to get away from that image of, well, you know, the, that this is something that's uh, hearkening back to a simpler time. Um, because cumulatively, this kind of mining small-scale gold mining, contributes um, the largest fraction of mercury releases to the world today. More than 40% of mercury pollution is caused by mining, uh, and specifically mining gold. So maybe there's a, a, only a little bit of use per person, but in areas where you have tens of thousands of people entering uh, protected areas uh, and indigenous community lands, um, it adds up. It's very similar to what happened in uh, the gold rush in California. Um, during the time there, people went to the hills to find the gold um, and uh, they essentially invaded areas, invaded indigenous communities uh, and in these lands. And they generated tremendous wealth, created cities like San Francisco. Um, however, they also uh, annihilated the uh, biodiversity of the area destroyed vast areas and left a legacy, a toxic legacy, that even in the United States, we have problems dealing with. We still can't eat the fish in San Francisco Bay because of the mercury. Um, that's playing out uh, in real time in places like Madre de Dios, where you have uh, what's been estimated uh, nearly 200 tons of mercury released to the rivers and lakes of this region. It's a toxic legacy that people in places like Madre de Dios and across the Amazon are having to deal with and understand to be able to protect the health of their families. And uh, we don't even know how it's affecting animals. There's a body of research um, that has indicated that uh, the effects that we see in the Amazon are likely to persist for centuries. We really haven't done this kind of societal experiment before, so we don't really know what's going on. And, Scientists like the ones that work at Cynthia are working to understand not only where the mercury is, but how it moves, how it affects people, and especially how it affects the environment. Um, Miles talked about the importance of this area as a biodiversity hotspot. Um, and there are lots of preserves and reserves and national parks to protect this biodiversity. 
but uh, but we may be hollowing out um, these uh, areas by saturating it with heavy metals that get integrated into these food chains. And we're still unclear about, uh, are we changing the nature of the game for survivorship for uh, many of the most important species? Uh, and I'm not just talking about the ones that tourists want to see, but the ones that are kind of the linchpin for holding together ecosystems. There's a lot of talk of climate change uh, contributing to a tipping point in the Amazon. Dynamics like having mercury integrated into the fabric of ecosystems may be contributing to getting closer to that tipping point without really understanding what that dynamic is. And that's something that we are uh, very interested in and really needs to be figured out. So before I move to Deborah, I want to just remind everyone that this is all taking place because of this small scale gold mining. This is what's driving this uh, toxicity. It's what's driving deforestation. It starts driving these environmental impacts. One last quick question, um, Luis, and that is there's some new research that just came out that you and Miles were involved in, that mercury isn't just getting into the water and fish. It's also getting into trees and plants and animals of all kinds. So how much do we know about these impacts? What do we not know about these impacts? And what do we need to know? Well, we it's not only that we don't know the impacts. We're still figuring out the mechanisms and how mercury moves um, in these mining areas, in these tropical landscapes. So the origin of the mercury starts with the mining process, but it travels through ways that we're still discovering. Previously, people thought that mercury traveled mainly through water because water is needed during the mining process and it's released to rivers uh, and lakes and it travels where the water flows. The research that we published uh, earlier this year described a new mechanism of how mercury, when also released into the air, can travel with prevailing winds and be deposited in tropical rainforests tens or hundreds of kilometers away. And it's taken up by trees and integrated into the soils underneath those forests and potentially into the trees themselves. That was something that was not well understood. It was suspected, but it was one of the first studies that demonstrated it. And that may seem like a small thing, but when we're talking about an area that is saturated not only through water, but in air with mercury and has vast forests. These forests are basically absorbing a tremendous amount of mercury that may be released um, slowly through kind of natural processes, or as in the case with the Western Amazon under climate change, could be drying out and be more susceptible to wildfires. That is a major concern because not only if you're going to burn down a forest, not only you're going to release the carbon, but release massive quantities of mercury at the same time, giving you this, this double whammy. Deborah, you're joining us from Brazil and you're with WWF Brazil. Um, is the situation with gold mining similar to where you are, as has been described by Miles and Luis? Or are there some key differences between what's happening in Brazil and what's happening in Peru? Um, I think part of the situation in Brazil is very similar to what uh, Miles described as in Madre de Dios, which is uh, the movement of small and artisanal mining uh, into more isolated areas in the Amazon. But in Brazil, we also have a very consolidated uh, ASGM scenario in the central part of Brazil. So that's areas that have been mined ever since uh, the 70s and continue to be mined on a kind of second wave due to the entrance mainly of the new technologies, like Miles was saying, the excavators, which allowed uh, the same soil to be reprocessed and mined, but in a completely different format. So many of those mines are legalized doesn't mean they operate uh, regularly or according to uh, responsible standards, but it's quite different from the total illegal mining that is happening specifically in three indigenous areas in Brazil. Deborah, your work includes a lot of remote mon monitoring of gold mining activities in, in the Amazon, which can be really challenging to do. 
Mm-hmm. Can you help us understand what you're learning from this remote monitoring and, and, and how do you use that information? A lot of the illegal mining goes on because it's very difficult to actually monitor it. Uh, so when we go to the governmental agencies, as we do as an NGO, and question them, you know, why are you allowing this to happen? This is an indigenous area. It's not supposed to be occupied by anybody except for the indigenous peoples. Uh, a lot of what they say is that it's really hard um uh, to monitor those areas, to go to these areas. It's very expensive uh, and very dangerous also. And ever since remote censoring came about, uh, I like to call it the best friend (laughs) of anyone that is trying to find a solution to this problem, because you can actually see a lot uh, from these images and a lot that can actually help either governments identify where illegal operations are happening, and then they can target those specific areas if they are willing to and if they want to, which is not always the case. But also it can help uh, the private sector to independently monitor and try to distinguish whether the gold that they're buying is coming from legal areas or illegal areas. So I think it presents a a real solution and a real tool for people that are interested in actually making sure they are not buying gold from these areas uh, with the impacts that my colleagues here have uh, pointed out. With your understanding of supply chains and and how gold is moving out of Brazil and and into the markets, Deborah, can you help us understand um, what percentage of that gold is coming from illegal sources, from illegal mining? And um, h- how how can purchasers really apply the knowledge that you are developing um, in Brazil to help help them understand that they're not enabling this, this problem to accelerate even more? Okay. So I'll answer to the specific question first. Uh, There's a study by the University of Minas Gerais uh, in Brazil that has used remote sensing to estimate how much of the gold that is uh, uh, going around in Brazil is legal or illegal. And according to their methodology, only 34% of the gold can be uh, guaranteed to be legal according to to the technology that they used. Uh, which included remote sensing and also documental analysis. Uh, So it's a lot, (laughs) around 70%. Uh, It doesn't mean that all of it is illegal, but that it could be illegal. So at the moment, for any purchaser, anyone who is buying gold from Brazil, the chances are very high that you are contributing uh, to the scenario that Miles and Luis have described. And I think I'll just take the opportunity, Justin, to question a little bit uh, the phrase you used, because you said also all this is happening because of the small and artisanal miners, more or less. All of this is happening because gold buyers are buying gold. Absolutely. uh, Only interested in what uh, is the best price they can get the gold for. And I think that's not uh, happening only to gold. So the Amazon is being burnt uh, because we, as developing countries, export cattle, soy, gold, iron at very cheap prices to international markets. And people are not interested in understanding if these prices actually allow uh, a break-even point for these entrepreneurs, okay, as we may call them, that would allow them even to have a responsible mode of production if they chose to. So I think one of the most interesting things that Amazon 8 does is to actually put all the actors uh, in the picture. So it's very common for people to talk about illegal mining, only looking at the illegal miners. And we are talking about a very complex supply chain that involves very powerful uh, gold buyers, not just jewelry buyers, but also international funds, international banks, and everybody sitting uh, very comfortably uh, buying gold at cheap prices and not really interested in doing uh, simple checks and simple due diligence that could really help uh, make a difference. How can they make more of an effort to um, to be part of the solution, so to speak, as a part of the demand that's driving all this destruction? 
there are tools that have come up that will allow private sector agents to actually do that part independently, okay? We developed a very simple tool by which you can actually get the number of the mine that is producing this gold, and you can plot the mine and actually see the mine and also access uh, some basic documental uh, analysis that is made on the basis of public documents. And from in three minutes, Justin, you can rule out the chance of the gold coming from an indigenous area, a conservation unit, and from a fake mine, as we call it, a ghost mine, okay, which is basically a mine that is uh, buying and selling gold and it's not even operating because that means it's coming from an illegal area. So that uh, we developed a partnership with the University of Sao Paulo and they have developed a platform which will be actually uh, launched very soon. You can actually just by putting the name of the number of the mine have this check. And what does that mean? It means that you as a gold buyer, whether you are in Dubai or in London or in Canada, you can go into this platform for free and run your risk analysis, okay? Because if you put the number of the mine and it's a ghost mine, don't buy, okay? The system is a little bit more complex than that. So sometimes it's not inside an indigenous area. It's not inside a conservation unit. It's actually operating, but let's say, it's gone a little bit off their boundaries and has deforested Ill illegally. Okay, so that's a, a little bit more difficult uh, to assess, but it's also possible. You as a gold buyer, you can also make your choices. Okay, so this gold costs this amount. Okay, it's not inside an indigenous land, it's not an, inside a conservation unit, but perhaps it's deforested a hectare. Is that important to you? Buy or don't buy? Okay, so it's about choice. And essentially, you know, as there's an expression I used to like very much, which, which is the risk society. Okay, this is a tool that allows you to measure the risk of buying gold from a specific buyer. And I think uh, people all over the world, as they start to do that, which is a small effort, uh, can really make a change in the supply chain because it will force downwards for everybody to start looking at the origin of the gold and making sure that it doesn't come from an area like Madre de Dios, like Miles and Luis were saying very well, why we shouldn't buy gold from these areas. This technology that you just described, this sort of tracking that you just described, mm -hmm. how available is it now? And when will it be widely available uh, to the consumers and purchasers of gold outside South America? Okay, this specific tool will be available uh, by the end of the year. Okay, and WWF Brazil is, uh, has supported its development uh, through the University of Sao Paulo. But this technology, it can be uh, used by anybody. So you don't necessarily have to use this one. So this one, it, we just made it really simple and user-friendly and really cheap and fast for everybody who is interested in that. But you as a refinery or, or a buyer, you can, uh, you can do it yourself basically just because it's so simple so and so cheap, okay? These images, they are available for free. The documentation is available online by the governmental agencies. So, you know, we just kind of got this stuff together to make it even simpler. But there are many other solutions, okay? People are talking about blockchain, so you can use these kind of images in blockchain. We have some uh, gold sellers in Brazil that have developed their own internal due diligence systems. Uh, and they do that for international buyers. So also if you are an international buyer buying from a DTVM in Brazil, you can also do your role by asking, what are you doing to make sure that this gold is not coming from an illegal area? So there are many ways of doing it, Justin, but I think the clear message is that it's really possible to do it. It's cheap and you are not going to be out of gold <laughs> because you know some people yeah. may think oh you know so if i if i put all these demands you know i won't have gold to buy no there is enough uh, gold being produced legally in brazil perhaps not at responsible standards uh for you to to buy at the moment so i want to open this up to all of you and i want to start with this question that's come up quite a bit with all three of you and that is illegal gold mining the possibility of legal gold mining uh miles what is keeping 
Peru from uh, going through the process of legalizing more minors. So there's more regulation, more oversight, less environmental damage, while they still have the opportunity to make a living from this process. Yeah, I think that that's an important distinction. So we lump everything into illegal and there's uh, kind of two levels of legality. One is, is the area that the mining's happening on titled to mining? And so that's one level of legal. And a lot of the mining is happening on places that are titled to mining. And uh, back when these were set up, uh, the agencies were different. So there are many mines that are titled for agriculture, mining, forestry, and maybe even in, on a protected area or in the buffer of a protected area. So one level of getting uh, this straightened out is just straightening, straightening out the land titling. But then on top of that, you have what happens at that mine. And uh, do you have to mitigate the mine? And so there is uh, a process that's being developed for formalization. So then you get into what's formal mining, and what's informal mining. Informal mining doesn't pay taxes. They often don't uh, do environmental uh, mitigation. So how do you move from informal to formal? And uh, there's a process that keeps getting close to the goal line. And then the goal line keeps getting pushed back. And there's a understandable reason for that is that uh, if the land titling isn't sorted out, if you don't have good regulations and then the ability to enforce that, why are you going to demand that all these people comply with these regulations? And uh, some comply, some don't, but they don't have any way to reach the goal line. Uh, the other reason is much more nefarious, and that is there's a whole lot of interests that don't want the gold mining to be legalized, and they don't want that to happen. And so what's happening is uh, criminal activities at high levels and corruption are just keep pushing the formalization deadline back. And what that allows is people to operate in ways that are uh, incredibly damaging, not just to the environment, uh, uh, but to society as a whole. This question is really to you and, and, and Deborah, and that is, is the government of Peru and Brazil interested in trying to solve this problem or even address this problem at a high level? Miles, why don't you start? Yeah. So Peru has been interesting in the last few years is that uh, they've been changing presidents out at about an annual rate. And so at high levels of the government, there's an immense amount of uncertainty. And one of the things if you're a business that you want is certainty. So for a lot of this mining, uh, if you set what had to be done in a mine and you enforced what had to be done in a mine and you agreed on that as society, then the miners could decide because they're entrepreneurs, they could decide whether they could meet that or they could go do something else. Um, so I think at high levels, it becomes very difficult because it, it's disconnected from the mine and there's this immense amount of, of just uncertainty and, and corruption. At low levels, yes. Uh, what's one of the, the things that I think is underappreciated is if you look at the mayors of these towns, if you look at the people in Madre de Dios who are working within the government of Madre de Dios, they want to solve this problem because they live there. They don't want their kids being poisoned. They don't want their daughters being trafficked. They don't want to live under the threat of being assassinated by sicarios. So uh, yes, there's a lot of governmental interest at the local level, and it's at the higher level where I think that these things, you start to get the disconnects. Luis, I wanna move this to you because um, you know so much of this mining uh, is taking place, whether it's legal or illegal, it, is, it hinges on the use of mercury. Can mining be done effectively, and profitably without mercury? Yes. Um, so mercury is a, is a is a effective way of doing it. It's a simple way of doing it, but it has a lot of cost to it. And and the the and I'm not talking about price. I'm talking about environmental costs and the cost potential cost to human health if it's not controlled. The state of Mato Grosso is uh, trying to regulate small scale mining that uses mercury in a way that's less damaging. Mercury is highly toxic, and if not controlled, it has the potential for causing lasting environmental damage. Um, so there is a movement, uh, and it is not a kind of a grassroots movement. This is something that, uh, uh, that has been uh, a trend over the last 30 years to reduce and eventually eliminate the use of mercury, not just in mining, but across society. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the UN's Minamata Convention on Mining that's signed by 126 countries to over the scope of about 40 years, wean the world off of the use of mercury in industry, instruments, uh, and especially mining um, to, to basically safeguard uh, the, the future for, for people. So that it begs the question, if you're not gonna use mercury, what can you use? 
because the demand for gold is essentially everlasting. It's it's the perfect commodity because there is almost an infinite demand for gold. So if that's the case, there needs to be something that not only large companies, because mining is not just done by small scale miners, but you know giant mining operations, uh, has to be done that can be used at all scales. Um, cyanide has typically been the solution that's done because it's extremely efficient. Um, the one thing that my, uh, mercury does, it, it is simple that can be used by anyone, but it's relatively low efficiency, maybe 35, 40% of the gold that's in sediments are captured using the amalgamation process, which is a process of using mercury. Um, cyanide allows you to get above 95%, and with really efficient systems, you can get nearly 99%. However, um, cyanide as well is very dangerous and is immediately dangerous and it needs uh, much stricter controls to have an efficient process and a safe one. Um, so, you know, what can small scale miners use that simple, that's not something that you essentially need, you know, uh, very professional chemists and chemical engineers to manage. Um, and also that's something that's maintainable in places like the Amazon. Um, there's been a lot of work to innovate these kinds of solutions. Um, Organizations like uh, Conservation X Labs that has recently been running uh, an Amazon, uh, uh, sorry, an artisanal mining innovation challenge uh, is, is trying to, uh, you know, bring together uh, a lot of minds to either develop new technologies and innovations or adapt innovations that have been used in other sectors like the tech sector and other consumer sectors to focus on artisanal mining because. Um, this is the source of a tremendous amount of uh, uh, economic opportunity for the poorest people on the planet. Um, and, and yet they're still using technology that's 2000 years old. So um, they're, you know, uh, so that's kind of a tough nut to crack. And I think it hinges that uh, the kind of the future of whether or not mercury is used uh, in the small scale mining sector and, and all the damages it can create it is going to hinge on whether or not we can harness knowledge, create innovations that can be used not just in one mine or another place, but at scale to transform and modernize this sector and contribute to these value chains as Deborah was describing them, and actually uh, allow consumers in countries like the United States to engage and support in the livelihoods of these people while getting the goal that they want. And protecting uh, rainforests and, well, tropical areas and, and the populations um, that they hold um, over the, the coming decades and centuries. I would just like to add uh, that there are some concrete experiences that uh, already exist. So, for instance, in Latin America, we have the experience with ARM, which is the Alliance for Responsible Mining, and they have the Fairmine Standards. Uh, which has uh, various graduations, but in its ultimate graduation, uh, the mine will not be using mercury. And of course, they will be getting a bonus price uh, for producing that specific way. And that, uh, there is an international market that is consuming uh, that gold from those specific mines. So of course, certification presents uh, a few challenges. It's uh, more expensive. It's not easily scaled up, but there we have some clear demonstrations, some concrete demonstrations that it's possible to do it if consumers are willing to pay the price. This has been an extraordinary session. We have covered a lot of ground and uh, we have learned a lot uh, about what's happening, about the impact, um, about what could be done, what are potential uh, interventions, about what's driving demand, uh, so much of it from outside the area where it's taking place. Um, I have one final question that I would like each of you to address. And, and in your view, and, and again, with the gold industry in mind, with the consumers of gold in mind, what strategy would you recommend to push responsible mining and the purchase of gold in a sustainable and less destructive direction? Miles, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I I would pick up on uh, some of the things that, that Deborah had said earlier and, and think about the experience of Brazil. And uh, to remind people that the, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good in this case. So I think one of the things that we want to avoid in gold supply chains is creating so many conditions for the producer that they can't meet them. 
And I think, you know, if you can get a percentage of people producing, then as Deborah said, you can start to, to let the market force that spread through, through the miners. And when we put these gold standards that force people to interact in ways that don't go along with the fabric of their society or to meet conditions that really don't have much to do with either the environmental protections or the movement of gold into the chains, that, uh, that we're actually forcing the market uh, towards criminal activity. I think we really need to be sensitive to that. Luis. Yeah, actually, so... I mean, I think there needs to be a focus on education of the consumers. Um, and, and that's an extraordinarily important uh, aspect of it because, I mean, we're now at a point in, in most societies where um, organic coffee uh, and, orga and uh, fair traded and uh, responsible commodity goods are something that society is moving towards and, and is willing to pay for it. Um, however, in one of the most valuable commodities, gold is really nowhere near there. Um, there are some, uh, I would say, baby steps in that direction. Small producers and responsible jewelers are taking the lead. Um, however, it, it has not yet caught fire and, and people aren't yet willing to pay. Uh, and it's uh, something that has extraordinarily important repercussions. Um, it needs a, to send a signal. Uh, back down the supply chain that people are willing to pay for it. And the other are the, the major gold buying houses. Um, these are extraordinarily powerful uh, actors because there are few of them for the global supply system. Um, uh, and so refiners and gold buyers have an extraordinarily uh, important role to play. Um, and, uh, and miners are economic actors. Um, they are uh, not causing the environmental damage because they want to, but as a byproduct of a sector that has not um, modernized and, and, and been made um, and has not been empowered to use the technological solutions that have benefited different parts of society. Um, so the move to modernize it will need to come from the premiums that are provided by people that are willing to do the right thing um, and to the benefit of everyone involved. Um, since there are um, more than 100 million people involved uh, in the small scale mining sector in more than 80 countries, we're talking about a revolution that uh, will span the globe. And I think that uh, essentially gives me hope um, that this problem can be solved. Um, and, and I hope that uh, that will occur essentially in my timeline. Oh, I think Luis uh, spoke really well. I think I would just, uh, I think he spoke really well about consumer choice. I mean, this is a real oh. thing. It happens in other sectors, in organic products. I mean, people will pay two, three times as much for a product uh, that is coming from a specific uh, coffee farm. So why not? Uh, do it for gold, uh, which is also an area where people even have more purchasing power than somebody that buys a cup of coffee, right? So that's, I think that's really important. Uh, so I think unless we move to a model where people are willing to pay more, I mean, essentially the, the fact that the price of gold is a commodity is a real bottleneck for changing the way that it's produced. It could not be uh, determined by international markets. I mean, it should oscillate a little bit more in order to contemplate the cost of producing responsibly. And that means paying for the price of land, not operating in illegal lands, paying for the price of protecting the environment and paying for the price of labor. And the world is extremely used to buying products from the Amazon, not just Brazil, all countries at cheap prices, because it does not take into account the price of land, labor, and the environment. And we are going to eat up the forest. We are going to wear the products of the forest in our earrings if it doesn't stop. And it's simple. It's a pricing issue. People have to be willing to pay more in order for this gold to be produced in a responsible way. There's so much that you've offered us in this discussion and uh, so many pieces that fit together nicely. Uh, it seems pretty clear that the path that lies ahead um, is available 
and um, and achievable. But it's going to take a lot, obviously, as you are all agreeing and you're all telling us, it's going to take a lot from outside of South America to bring these changes about uh, for the betterment and the protection of one of the most critical ecosystems on Earth. So I want to thank you all uh, for your time and for your insight and for the research you do uh, in these incredibly vulnerable parts of the world. So in closing, I would like to thank the Amazon Aid Foundation, Amazon Aid's Cleaner Gold Network, Wake Forest's Center for Energy, Environment and Sustainability, the university's Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation, as well as our trio of experts for developing and participating in this critically important discussion. Thank you all. Thank you.